didn't know it came from a network. And we used uh, tree methods to, 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 to estimate uh, a tree. So what we would love for a tree method would be that it will return the underlying tree structure. So the tree in black, a tree without the gene flow arrow um, and that has the main vertical signal of, of data. That's what we would want out of our tree method. It turns out that that doesn't happen every time. So we compare three methods, concatenation, astral, and NJST. Uh, concatenation performed poorly in both scenarios, so I'm not gonna talk about this. Um, astral and NJST, they are both coalescent based methods in which you first go from your sequences to gene trees and then from gene trees to species tree. Uh, depending on the value of gamma, that is the performance that we get. So the top row here uh, corresponds to simulated data when gamma is equal to 0.1. That means 10% of my genes get transferred through the gene flow event. And the bottom row corresponds to gamma equals 0.3. So it's larger proportion of genes that get transferred through the horizontal path. Um, what we can see from these figures is that if gamma is 0.1, uh, both astral and NJST perform well. The proportion of genes, here, I'm, I'm well here, I'm, I'm counting as the proportion of times that we reconstruct the correct tree, the tree in black here by white bars. So as I increase, increase my number of genes, that's the X axis, the proportion of times that I goes to 100%. So both cases, they, they are doing what they should do. However, when gamma is 0.3, that does not happen anymore. You will see that this white bar, the proportion of times that we reconstruct the correct tree really is going down to zero to the point where if you're doing NJST, if you have a thousand genes in your sample, you never reconstruct the true tree. So it seems like what is happening is that this gene flow is distorting the signal from your data. And what is really um, problematic is that there is not a clear threshold for gamma. So for this specific case, we identify what is called the anomaly zone on gamma to be between 0.2 and 0.8, but this is very specific to the, G, the network topology, the branch lengths that we used. So this anomaly zone is not the same for any network topology, any branch lengths. In general, this is very specific to this case. Since the network is unknown, the branch lengths are, are unknown, also the anomaly zone is unknown. So we don't know if we fall within this anomaly zone area and we should not be using a tree method to estimate the, the, main, the main tree. And to explain why this is happening, we have to remember a concept called uh, anomalous gene trees. And if you remember for, from a while back, there was this paper from James Degnan where he showed that there are no anomalous gene trees when you have only four taxa in your sample. And anomalous gene trees are the gene trees that have a higher proportion of, or a higher probability of appearing in your sample but they are conflicting with the species tree. So let's look at this specific example in here. I have this network on, um, on the left and there is one gene flow event, but the gene flow event is ancestral to the speciation of A and B. So we would expect gene trees to have the AB clade because the gene flow was before that. I mean, the, the, the speciation should appear, this AB clade should appear in the gene trees. If there is no gene flow, so gamma is equal to zero, then we in fact have the proportion of genes that have the AB clade is higher to the gene trees that do not have the AB clade. So we will observe in our sample 0.35%, uh, not percent, 35% of our gene trees will have the AB clade compared to the ones who, who, who don't have it. So it is the, 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 the split that has the highest frequency. But if we have gene flow in our data, gamma is 0.1, gamma is 0.3, suddenly these frequencies, they flip. And the split that agrees with the underlying tree suddenly has the smallest frequency or the smallest probability. This is what this then in this case, the AC clade, CB clade, the, the conflict with the main tree are denoted um, anomalous gene trees. So while James Degnan showed that when you have only four taxa, this is a case of only four taxa, if you have only four taxa in your, say, in your data, there are no anomalous gene trees when you have ILS only. We showed in our work that if you have gene flow events, 
then you can have anomalous gene trees, even with as little as four taxa or three taxa even when they're on rooted. So the, what is the saying is that the presence of gene flow can cause certain um, topologies on your gene trees to be present in higher frequencies in your sample compared to the ones that agree with the species tree. And that's why the gene tree, the, the species tree method will be fooled by the signal that you're getting from your data. So uh, once we include a network method in the play, in this case, we was Pilonet, and now I'm plotting uh, mean Robinson fool's distance with between the estimated tree and the true tree here, again, the one on the top right uh, corner, the, we see that the distance from Phylonet really goes to zero as you increase your sample size or your number of genes. And this is distance to the tree. So it is if, if you are interested in the main tree, if there was gene flow, you should still use a network method. That is the message of this story. You can ignore the gene flow event later, you forget about it, but you will have the correct underlying tree structure that it will be more robust to gene flow, obviously, than species tree methods um, alone. Now, um, hopefully that I've convinced you that it's worth um, learning how to use network methods. There are different flavors of network methods that you will see out there. There are the ones that will take uh, multi-locus sequences as input directly into the estimation of an explicit network. These are examples like these two and Phylonet. And there are the two-step approaches that we also know from, from species tree, where we first need to estimate uh, gene trees from the sequences and then from the gene trees, we estimate an explicit network. This is the case of Phylonet again. Phylonet has many flavors and also SNAC, which is the method that I created with Cecilia and, and that's the one I'm gonna be focusing on mostly. But before I get to that, I wanted to give you just a small picture of the different method options that are out there. Um, for the, the cases that the, the, the one-step methods or co-estimation methods, uh, both are Bayesian in nature, and the, the parameters of interest are the network topology. You could estimate, co-estimate the gene trees or just uh, integrate over them. That's a choice that you can have. And then theta here represents all numerical parameters like branch lengths and characters probabilities. The data, like I said, are multi-local sequences. So you assume that you have L loci that you have already um, identified before. And it, first on the likelihood part, it has the two parts, of course, the multi-species coalescent model that gives us probabilities of gene trees given a network. And I will focus on this multi-species coalescent model in the next slide. And we have the standard substitution model that governs how sequences evolve on a given gene tree. Uh, like I said, both methods are Bayesian and they impose a prior on the network. And the, the main distinction between these two and Phylonet is what is that prior? Uh, BIS2 has a more, I, I like to call it a, an explicit prior because you're really modeling the birth and hybridization events. So if you're familiar with the birth and death process, this is very similar. You have birth as a speciation, and then you have events that are called hybridizations where you're joining two lineages. And just by how these different events are happening in time, that's how you get the probability of a given topology. Uh, Phylonet does not have any prior on the actual topology or the events for hybridization, it's simply imposing a prior on the number of reticulation. So you don't want to have too many reticulations. So you have, I don't recall, I should have checked before the talk, but it, it could be a Poisson or I don't recall exactly, but you are focusing, you're, you're choosing a prior that does not allow you to include too many reticulations. And it also has a second prior that, um, it's, it's a prior for the cycle diameter. So a given hybridization event will create a cycle or blob in your topology. And you don't big because that will involve uh, gene flow uh, between different, far, very far apart lineages um, in, your, in your underlying tree. So they control the cycle diameter with another prior. So the main distinction between these two are just the, the type of prior that they do. Um, but of course, as you might suspect, this uh, one step estimation or co-estimation is very time consuming and it's not very scalable to, to large data sets, which is why people prefer to do the two-step approach where you first estimate gene trees and then from gene trees, you take the gene trees as known to estimate a network. 
And again, in this case, there are two options. There is the pylon at Bayesian, the pylon at maximum likelihood. Um, the prior on the Bayesian is the same one as they had from the other approach. Um, the third option, which is the one that I'm going to focus on more today, is where you don't take the gene trees directly as input. You first summarize their information into what's called concordance factors. And using the concordance factors, we create a pseudo likelihood function that is the one that we estimate in SNAC. So I'm going to be focusing, of course, on this part because it's the one that I created with Cecilia. In it, but I wanted to give you a quick overview of what other network methods. And of course, I, I should also say this is not an extensive list. So I'm focusing on the case for when you have multi-local sequences as input. If you have SNPs, there are many other methods out there that, that you can use. Also, there is Heidi from, from Laura's uh, lab, and there's also SnapNet that recently appeared. Um, and man, there are many others. And so this is not an extensive list of network methods, obviously. Um, and like I showed you, the, um, the likelihood uh, depends on this multi-species coalescent model. And uh, so first I want to remind, remind us of what it is, what it looks like on a tree, and then what is the extension for a network. So the multi-species coalescent on a tree simply is looking at a specific population on a branch in the species tree, where we are first grabbing two lineages, one from A and one from B, and we're tracing back who is the ancestor of each of these lineages. So when they are within their own population, so the population A and the population B, well, those ancestors are fully contained within that population, but they will reach a time here where these two lineages will reach the common population. So now they can coalesce, or by that we mean they can find a common ancestor. This, this is more circles represent individuals in the population, and uh, which is why we sometimes like to draw the species tree branches as fat branches, because we think that there's a population within this branch and uh, that we draw it with the circles. And the coalescent model is simply modeling how long do I have to wait for these two lineages to coalesce? And that is given by an exponential uh, model. So if I denote by big T, capital T, the, um, the time that I need to wait for two lineages to coalesce, um, this is given by an exponential with uh, mean one because there's only two of them. When I have these two lineages in the population for the gene tree to agree with the species tree, then I need them to coalesce in this time. So the probability that the coalescence time is greater than the branch length that I have that is the probability that they just don't coalesce in this window. And that is given by e to the minus t by the exponential. So just to give a little bit of intuition, if this branch length grows to infinity, is really, really, really long, then A and B have a lot of time to coalesce. Yes? So it is very likely that they will coalesce because there's a lot of time for these two lineages to find a common ancestor. So that's why this probability, we see that it goes to zero as t goes to infinity. On the contrary, if this branch is really, really, really small, then the two lineages will not have time to coalesce before reaching the other population coming from C. So it is very likely that they will not coalesce, and then there is a higher probability that they will coalesce with C or with someone else. So uh, with this multi-species coalescent model, we can calculate the probability of any gene tree within the branches of the species tree. So if we want the gene tree to display the AB clade, we want A and B to coalesce in this branch. And that happens with probability one minus E to the minus T. Or if they don't coalesce, they could still coalesce at the root. Yeah, so if the fact that they don't coalesce in that window does not mean that they're not gonna coalesce. They could still coalesce at the root. And that happens with probability one third. Because uh, once we reach the root, yes, I have just a quick question okay, because you said it's a probability of the gene tree. Um, I mean, is it a species tree here, this branch ABC in your P, or is it really the gene tree? Because um, what are the genes? Uh, is A, is, 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 is capital A a species or a gene? Oh, okay. It, uh, it's confusing because it means both in my, in my drawing. So in this case, species A, B, in the figure here on the left, this is the species tree. So yeah. these are just species. And in the, the, so let's just say the fat tree is a species tree and the thin tree here, this is a gene. This is a gene tree. So we have the species tree, 
that we think of a parameter of the coalescent model, and the gene tree is the one that lives within the branches of the species tree. But but in, in your uh, drawing, the, the gene tree is, is isomorphic to the species tree. And I mean, this is, of course, often not the case. Often I, not the case, don't... yes. OK. Yes, and that, that's what's going to happen in the next slide. I can, I can show you in the next slide, okay. if that's OK. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for the question. So um, at this point, all that, that I'm saying is that this is the tree that agrees with the species tree. So in this case, the gene tree agrees with the species tree. And given the coalescent model, that happens with probability one minus two thirds to e to the minus t. But as um, I didn't check the name of who was asking, but um, as they were saying, it could not be the case. So we could have a gene tree that does not agree with the species tree, and that will happen with different probabilities under the coalescent model. So for example, if we focus on the figure in the middle, we still have the same species tree that has the clade AB, but in this case, A and B, the lineages, they did not coalesce in their window. So now we have B coalescing with C and we will observe a different gene tree um, because they did not coalesce in their window. And what is gonna give us information uh, about, um, I wanna say the frequencies in which we observe the different gene trees will provide information about whether we have an underlying tree or an underlying network which is what I'm going to show in the next in the next slide. So when we have a species coalescent now on a network, it is the exact same model on the tree branches, but now the lineage from B will have a choice. This lineage from B will have it will reach a hybrid node at one point, and it will now have a probability gamma of following one path, and probability one minus gamma of following another path. So it is exact same coalescent model that we had from before, but now the lineage has some horizontal edges where there is a probability of following those different paths. So again, under a given network, species network, we can calculate the probability of any gene tree given that network branch lengths and gammas. So our parameters again are the network topology, the branch lengths and the inheritance probabilities. And we will see like, of course, we don't have time to get into too many details, but given the, depending on the class of networks, how complex they are, these probabilities tend to be weighted average of probabilities of trees. So if we have a one minus gamma probability, the lineage from B will follow the standard path with probability gamma, it will follow the hybrid edge, the minor hybrid edge. And with this uh, likelihood um, coalescent model on a network, that's how we calculate the likelihood of any given network. Um, you can calculate this for a network of any size, obviously, but it becomes increasingly challenging as you increase the number of species. To the point, I mean, it has been proven that just, just the computation of the likelihood is empty hard, um, which is why a lot of the, when you're either um, searching the space of networks via MCMC or when you are doing um, maximum likelihood, um, just evaluating or optimizing the likelihood can be time consuming. And, and I'm not even talking about searching the space of networks yet. So one way in which we try to uh, improve scalability, uh, Cecile and I, was by doing this divide and conquer approach. So instead of calculating the likelihood of the network as a whole, we used a quartet-based inference in which we would extract a quartet that is a subgraph with only four leaves, and we will calculate the likelihood of that quartet. And then we will extract another quartet, and then we will calculate the likelihood of that quartet. So we will only be calculating likelihoods of networks or trees that have four leaves. So that will improve our computation. But now we are multiplying them all together of the likelihoods of all the different quartets, which of course we know that they are not independent. So the quartets are sharing edges, so we don't expect them to be independent. So our resulting measure is a pseudo likelihood, it's not a real likelihood. But it was, but what we showed was that we improving scalability uh, without losing much accuracy, as I will show you next. And Can everything I ask that we, it? yes. Yeah, you're talking about quartets, right? I mean, do you consider yes. them as unrooted or as rooted? Great question. And we consider them unrooted. Rooted quartets, okay. Unrooted, okay, unrooted, unrooted. Okay. No, mm -hmm. no root. Yeah. No and root. And I will mention that no root, no root. Unrooted. But 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 you aim at finding rooted networks. 
No, 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 no. Everything no, is no, unruled here. Okay, I see. Okay. Yes, and I will get to that in the next slide. Yes, thank you for asking. Um, so we implemented the whole pseudo likelihood um, in this Julia package called Philo Networks. And if people are not familiar with Julia, I would strongly encourage you to try it out. We found it very easy to code and very, very scalable and efficient. And the main function, of course, well, I, I don't know if it's the main function anymore because Cecile has been adding so many functions to file networks, but one of the functions in file networks is SNAC, which is the pseudo likelihood estimation. SNAC stands for Species Network Applying Quartets because it's a quartet based um, optimization and we are doing this, the pseudo likelihood. File networks, I should say that it has many other network functions, not just the estimation via pseudo likelihood that I'm gonna briefly mention at the end of this talk. Um, there are three things that we like about SNAC compared to other network methods, uh, aside from scalability. So I will convince you later, I mean, the SNAC is the most scalable option of all the network methods that I described. Um, the ones that I described, I said this is not an extensive list, but uh, there are three things that we like about SNAC aside from the scalability. Uh, one is that we use unrooted gene trees as input. So the other network methods require that you root your gene trees. Um, so because we don't need root for the gene trees, we don't, uh, we, we don't have the potential for rooting error. Uh, also, we don't need branch lengths on the gene trees. So we only need the gene tree topologies. And because of that, we again, don't have any assumptions on molecular clock or rate of evolution from the gene trees. And third, we don't take the gene trees directly as input as perfectly known. Uh, we first summarize them as concordance factors. And the summary process, which I, did not have much time to describe, but it's, it's a way in which we can account for estimation error. So we are basically trying to separate that we see difference between gene trees, but some of that difference could be explained by estimation error. And we really want to estimate what is true discordance that is driven by the gene flow or, or incomplete lineage sort of thing. Um, just a little bit on the quartets, if we have uh, the, quart the concordance factor, sorry. If we have um, this, as my input gene trees. And now here I'm drawing them unrooted because now I told you they're really unrooted. Um, instead of having the gene tree topologies as my, as my input, I'm gonna be taking all subsets of four taxa and calculate concordance factors for each subset. So my original data in this example has five taxa, A, B, C, D, E. Um, I take four taxa randomly for, for now. I do all the subsets of four, but let's just focus on A, B, C, D for now. Um, with four taxa, A, B, C, D, there are three possible quartet resolutions. There is the A, B, C, D split, so A, B are together. There's the A, C, B, D split, so A and C are together, or the A, D, B, C split, so A and B are together. So these are the only three possible quartet resolutions, unrooted quartet resolutions for four taxa. And now for each of these resolutions, I go back to my gene trees and I see, do I have this quartet in this gene tree and I count. So for example, in this case, I have five gene trees, three of them in red have the AB resolution. So I have three out of five um, gene trees displaying the, the AB split. I have one out of five displaying the AC split and one out of five displaying the blue split. And this is for the, for taxon subset A, B, C, D, I can do that for all subsets of four. And I will ultimately have a table of what we call the observed concordance factors that we got from, from our gene trees. And then our pseudo likelihood, we can actually decompose it as um, having two, two major components, the observed concordance factors and the expected concordance factors that come from a specific network. Those expected concordance factors are the ones that we calculate with the multi-species coalescent model. So to give you one example of how we would calculate it, if we have this um, quartet, or because it's a network, we, we can call it quartet. Um, if we want to know the expected concordance factor of this quartet, um, we, we found out in our paper that it's just a weighted average of concordance factors between of two trees. So if we look at the specific drawing, for example, with probability one minus gamma, A is gonna be following the black path. So we will be ignoring this whole part here. 
So we ultimately only have the three quartet that has the branch length T1. But if A follows the hybrid path with probability, that happens with probability gamma, then A and B have more time to coalesce. They have the time T1 plus T2. They have a longer branch to coalesce. So this is just one example. Ultimately, what we do is we, for every extracted quartet from the network, I can calculate the expected concordance factors and I will compare them to the observed concordance factor. Not, not a I comparison, obviously, it's just an evaluation of the pseudo likelihood. And ultimately, we will find um, the network that agrees whose expected concordance factors agree the best with the observed concordance factors. Um, Okay, so some scalability. Um, we compared SNAG with Phylonet on four different networks. The smallest one has only six species, one hybridization. The largest had uh, 15 species, three hybridization events. So first of all, uh, for the largest one, we could not even run Phylonet. This is the uh, maximum likelihood Phylonet using gene trees as input. So it's not even the co-estimation starting with sequences um, is the process. It's, I'm already estimating gene trees and using them as input into Phylonet, and it's doing maximum likelihood, it's not doing Bayesian. So for the network, yes. Yeah, another question. So when you say n equals six, this means the number of, of species? Leaves. Or what? Of yes, leaves and the number species, of species tree. Yeah, and, and the x-axis is then the number of genes or gene families or? Um... The number of genes. The number of genes. Number of genes. Okay, I see. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yes. Sorry, uh, yes I, I, I have not that. seen. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. So, sorry. No. 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 Rush. And actually, I should have said that. So n equals six means six leaves, and h one means the number of hybridization events that we have in the network. And here, the x-axis is as I'm increasing my sample size or my number of gene trees. In this case, the number of genes, but they're really gene trees because what we're using as input as are the gene trees. Um, so first of all, so Phylonet, we could not run it with um, a network with size 10, two hybridization events whenever we had more than 100 gene trees. So 100 was the largest that we could run that took to briefly 200 hours. And um, um, we are cheating, obviously. We are not using parallelized computation. We are both running them under the same uh, conditions. So if you have more nodes um, in, in your cluster, you could obviously run things faster. But still, we were not able to compare Phylonet with um, a larger network, and we were able to do that with, with SNAC. Um, so there are some scalability gains uh, by using SNAC um, compared to the standard likelihood, or in this case was the maximum likelihood, which was still expected to be the more scalable among the other options. Um, one thing that I wanted to focus on, aside from the scalability, was that, that for, we did a, um, well, maybe not the super thorough, but we did some study on identifiability for the model. In particular, we were focusing on the question of whether we could detect the presence of hybridization in level one networks. This is the very first moment that I mentioned level one networks, and um, I will mention it later when I summarize some of the conclusions from SNAC. SNAC, we had to make the assumptions that we are reconstructing level one networks because those were the ones that we studied for the presence of hybridization. At the moment, this is the only type of class that we can estimate, but we're working on extending to broader classes of networks that are, as I will mention later. Why do we need the level one network assumption? Well, because for the proofs, uh, we can focus on each cycle at a time. And if there are other cycles in these subgraphs, that's fine and we can pretend they are not there because of the way the proofs are, are written. So we, we can focus on each hybridization at a time uh, because of the level one um, assumption. And then to answer the question, can we detect the presence of hybridization? It turns out that the answer depends on the number of nodes in the hybridization cycle. If there are two nodes, we cannot detect this hybridization. If there are three or four nodes in the cycle, then yes, we can detect it under certain conditions on the number of leaves that we have on different subgraphs, on the sub, sub trees or sub networks. Um, if we have five or more nodes in the cycle, then yes, we can always detect it, um, which is great mathematically, but biologically it might not make the, the great of sense because if the, the cycle is really big, as I was mentioning before, that means that the donor and recipient of gene flow are very far apart on the tree. So that might not happen as much. 
biologically. And just to give you a little bit of the flavor of the proofs, um, so we, all of these proofs, we first mentioned them in the original SNAC paper in PLOS Genetics, but then we rewrote them uh, because that was, that was aimed at the biology audience. So it was not really, it was not the most mathematical version of the proofs. We regrow them recently and just posted them on archive. And just a, an idea of the of what we were studying, basically um, each network topology with branch lengths and gammas defines a set of polynomial equations as the concordance factors. And we would compare this set of polynomial equations to the ones without that hybridization event, the ones with the tree. So we have another set of polynomial equations given by the tree that is the same, exact same tree, uh, underlying tree as the network, but just removing that um, minor uh, hybrid edge. And the question was whether we could choose parameters in the tree in a way that they will produce the exact same set of concordance factors. And we found that under very, the condition that all branch lengths need to be between zero and infinity and gamma between needs to be between zero and one, we're able to prove that they will not share solutions on the concordance factors, the tree, the network and the tree. Uh, one thing to notice at this point is that our proof, they are only focusing on comparing a network to its underlying tree. We have not done proofs comparing another network. So it could be that two different networks are producing the same set of concordance factors. We have not investigated that. So we are just investigating whether they are the same as the tree. And this is just one example for the case of four nodes. Uh, we found that the, the, the two systems share solutions. The trivial case, if gamma is not there, of course they will share solutions. And if the, you force gamma to be between zero and one, then you start forcing some of the edges in the cycle to be, to be zero, and then moving to a smaller, smaller cycles until you eventually reach uh, the one that has only two, two nodes. Anyway, there are more details in the archive paper. I love this topic and I, I wish I had more time. I'm checking the clock <laughs> to see how, how I'm doing on time. Um, the, and I wanted to talk also about the accuracy and why we started exploring uh, identifiability in the first place. Well, we're statisticians, so we do care about identifiability, but also because we, when we started looking at the results from SNAC, we were a bit disappointed at the beginning because it seemed like SNAC was not finding the correct network. And let me just show you here, if we focus on, so again, here there are the same four networks increasing size. So um, from N6 nodes, uh, leaves to 15 leaves and three hybridizations. The orange represents the proportion of times that we do not estimate the correct network. So orange is bad. So first thing that we can see is that as we increase the network complexity, we estimate the topology worse than simpler networks, which is, I guess is understandable. Smaller networks, they're easier to estimate. Larger networks, more complex networks, they're harder to estimate. But now let me show you the difference between the white and this beige color. So the white represents, we, we are correctly estimating the network topology and the correct direction of the hybrid edges. So if I show you, one of these figures again. So we have the cycle in there, and also we have direction for the hybrid edges. So going back to the question, are we in the unrooted, rooted world? We are kind of in between because the network is really unrooted, but we do have the direction of the hybrid edges and of course, everything below them. Because if we know that time goes in one direction, then the root cannot be an A, because that will mean that the, 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 the time will be going in the different direction. So in SNAC, what we're estimating ultimately are level one semi-directed networks. And I know that semi-directed is something that we invented and there is a real computational term for this type of networks that I, I learned it at some point and I forgot. But anyway, so I, I refer to them as semi-directed. Some edges are directed, some edges are not. And please someone let me know what is the correct term if you know it. Um, when, when some of your node edges are directed and some are not. But anyway, just to, just to point that out in here. So in white, we are correctly identifying that the cycle is there, but we are also correctly identifying who is the hybrid in this cycle. Because you could have the cycle there, but then think that this other guy is a hybrid. You have the wrong direction of the hybrid edges. The cycle is the same, 
but what the, what's changing is who is the hybrid. So in that picture here, white is when we correctly identify the cycle and the edges, the direction of the edges. And you will see it was super depressing for this N2, N10, H2 network. We never found the correct direction of the hybrid edge. You will see the white is very small, but the beige here means we detect the correct unrooted network. So we at least detect that the cycle is there. We choose the wrong hybrid node, but we know that the cycle is there. So this is one thing that we found from SNAC, even though uh, in our simulation, then this is very specific to the case of four nodes in the cycle. We are able to place it with high accuracy. We know the cycle is there, but we don't know which one is the hybrid in the cycle. These two networks, they have the exact same unrooted topology the only thing that's changing is the placement of the hybrid node in the cycle. They have very similar pseudo likelihood score. So they, the pseudo likelihood score is, is, is almost the same. We cannot distinguish between these two networks with our pseudo likelihood method. And to, to be true, and one, one of the things that we're exploring right now is precisely this. Uh, what, 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 is it, what are the identifiability of our methods when we have these uh, four node cycles? We call them diamonds. Um, the, 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 that have four nodes in the, in the cycle. And it turns out that actually from our simulations, the two more complex ones, they both have diamonds. So they both have these cycles that have only four nodes, which explains why we were able to detect that the cycle was there, but not detect the presence of who was the hybrid in, in, in the story. So there's, what I'm trying to say from this is that there's still so much that we need to explore about when we can or what we can and cannot detect from, from the data. And to com complete with the identifiability part, we also studied whether we had enough um, information to estimate the numerical parameters. And again, the answer depends on the number of nodes in the cycle. Um, so um, just to, to show you, this is a figure that I like to show to, to biologists a lot because sometimes they think, well, okay, why do we need to care about the identifiability in the first place? Um, but it turns out that um, it can make a difference. It can, it can make a practical um, difference because, for example, here we simulate data under this network that has two diamonds. We call one a good diamond and the other one a bad diamond, and you will see why in a second. Uh, here I'm plotting the proportion of times that we correctly estimate the hybridization event. So if you want to estimate the or detect the good diamond, you need at least as little as 30 genes to detect the cycle and the correct direction of the hybrids. If you want to detect the bad diamond, you need 3,000 genes. So what we try to open up with our discussion, and this is a characteristic of the network. So this, just the way that the network is constructed. So a good diamond versus a bad diamond is only related on how many leaves are in each of these subgraphs. So if N0, N2 have at least two leaves, it's a good diamond. Bad diamonds arise when here you have only one guy, only one guy. And for example, in this case, you will see the hybrid three, two, one, there is only one leaf attached to each of these three nodes. So that's why it's called, it's a bad diamond. So it's a characteristic of the network topology but it's giving us information because when we're, do, we're developing a method to estimate networks, we tend to compare the network as a whole. And there could be parts of the network that we are, we are able to reconstruct with high accuracy and other parts that we just can't. So I, I think that there's still so much that we, can, um, that we can investigate on networks. And now I have to um, talk, I think I was super excited. <laughs> talking about, about networks and when I prepared my, my talk, because I said, yeah, I'm gonna talk about so many things that I can never talk about in, in usual talks. But anyway, I just, just very briefly, a few things. Um, we do five types of network moves when we traverse the space of networks. These are networks that, these are network moves that we took uh, from Phylonet. So we did our hybridizations, change the direction of the hybrid node, a uh, hybrid edge, I'm sorry, move origin or move target, of the hybridization, oh, I'm sorry. Move hybridization, move target, and then do it NNI for three edges. Now these moves, we just 
made them up. Uh, we have no guarantees that we can transverse the space of semi-directed networks. If you're familiar with the work of Philippe and Celine that they published in 2017, they, they, they have this extension of tree moves to network moves uh, called RNNI or RSPR1, the same. Um, this move origin, move target, they are the same. Uh, it's similar to this RNNI, uh, but in their work, it was for rooted networks. In our case, it's for semi-directed networks. And we have no guarantees, like I said, we don't know anything about the space of semi-directed networks. And that is one of the first things that uh, we're still missing. I mean, there's a lot of work and I think I could list everybody that is attending this talk that have worked on network space. Um, I'm sorry that I couldn't list everybody, but for us, we, we still don't know anything about the semi-directed network space. And we have those moves, but we don't have any guarantees whether we can traverse it or not. Um, another of the network challenge is identifiability. We talked a little bit, we started a little bit of the conversation for the pseudo likelihood case. Uh, there is so much to do <laughs> for the likelihood case uh, in general. There is of course this work from, from Celine's lab on the distinguishability of networks based on display trees, which was later um, extended. The conversation was extended by James Degnan saying that they are not distinguishable. These networks are not distinguishable um, by display trees, but they are distinguishable under the multi-species coalescent model. So again, th they could be distinguishable with one type of criteria, but not the other. Um, there is still so much work, I think, on identifiability, depending on different types of, of networks. And lastly, another one of the network challenges is how do we compare networks? Um, there are distance functions, um, mostly for rooted networks. So we end up having to root our networks to compare them. Uh, it would be great to have distance functions for, for the semi-directed case or for other uh, types of networks that we're using. And also how do we summarize information from a sample of networks? When we're doing Bayesian, when we're doing MCMC, when we're doing bootstrap, we end up with a sample of networks that now we want to summarize. And it's not just enough to say, oh, they are the same or they're not the same. We want to really look into the specific parts of the network because we just showed that um, different, some parts of the networks we could estimate with high accuracy, others we can't. So in what we do in file networks is we focus on different clades. So we focus on the hybrid clade, major sister clade, minor sister clades, and then just count the proportion of times that we see certain clades uh, in our bootstrap samples. But this is of course just one way of summarizing information from a net, uh, sample of networks. There are, there are many ways. So um, just uh, like a brief, brief overview to, to conclude, um, there, is, there are many challenges for, for networks and which makes it a really exciting, exciting area to work in. And I just want to finish by saying, where am I going now? This I've presented all work that has already been done. So what are the next steps for, for me and my, and my group? We are extending uh, SNAP to the Tree Child Networks class. Um, the Tree Child, which I'm sure people here are familiar with it, but if you're not, um, this is a, a tree child network. It's a network where at least one child of every internal node is a tree node. So if you have an internal node that is a tree node, at least one of the children has to be a tree node. So a violation would be that both are hybrids. And um, if you have a hybrid node, we usually assume that they only have one child in, in the, the networks that we reconstruct. So it's another assumption that I did not mention that they are binary, binary networks. So for this to be a tree child network, the, the child of the hybrid node needs to be um, a tree node. So this is a class that is already extended from the level one, but it still does not, it, it rules out some, some of the hybridization that we might see in reality. And uh, some of the other things that I'm doing uh, more recently that have nothing to do with networks is uh, we're looking a little bit into BHB space with some collaborators um, all over the place. Uh, we are trying to think of connections between the coalescent model and, and, and BHB space. And this is just ongoing work, but because I mentioned it in my abstract and then I decided to focus only on networks, then I said, okay, I'm just still gonna just say one thing in my slide. And then just if people have questions, feel free to, to reach out and ask. 
Uh, the other thing that I mentioned in my abstract that, again, I decided not to talk about it and just focus on, on, on the networks is uh, I'm working with a professor in math here at UW on, on neural networks. And basically, this is weird. It's a weird project. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know how well this is going to turn out. We are training a neural network to read um, sequences and the tree topology where they're coming from. These are only four taxa trees. So they are small trees. And these trees, they're just, they just like a label. So the neural network doesn't care. It just label tree one, tree two, tree three. And then we see if there's any pattern in the sequences that will allow the neural network um, to predict what is the tree that new sequences came from. Uh, the, it was inspired by some work that had been published, uh, the residual network result quartet phylogenies where they show, at least in that paper, that their neural network outperforms the standard phylogenetic techniques like RoxML, uh, Mr. Base, and, and Naval Joining. So anyway, we're still exploring. We're not seeing the same accuracy that they're getting, so we might be doing something wrong. But if people are interested to talk more, I'll be happy, happy to, 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 yeah, to answer any questions or to, to meet remotely. I think, I think the pandemic has opened up the possibility for remote meetings, so we now know that we don't need to be in the same place to schedule a meeting with someone and talk more about, about our research. So if anyone wants to follow up more on the networks or whatever it is that I talk, uh, feel free to email me. My, my email is at the bottom. Well, that's my website, but that's where you can find my email. And sorry if I'm talking super fast at the end, I plan a super ambitious talk. To conclude, just an advertisement of my package where my and Cecile's package because file networks like I said, SNAC is one of the functions that estimates networks from pseudo likelihood, but there are so many other functions that you can use. Specifically, um, we have the summary for bootstrap or samples of networks. So people that are doing Bayesian or MCMC and have samples of networks that they want to summarize, they can use our tools to summarize them. And also Cecile has put a lot of work on comparative methods for continuous trade evolution on, on a species network or even a tree. So, um, this is my last slide. I really want to leave some time uh, for questions. And um, so if there are any questions, these are all the, the great students that are working with me. And just to say, phylogenomics is the, the one of the parts that I really, one of the, the parts that I mostly enjoy about my research, but I'm starting to explore some other things outside of, of phylogenomics, more like a microbiome or genomics areas. Um, okay, so I'll shut up and I'll stop sharing and I'll wait to see if people have any questions.